Okay, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to introduce a new thing. So up until this point, we have only been dealing with axial forces, whether they were uh, in a truss, a truss member, um, or maybe they were just on a plate, or we did the uh, the yoke kind of thing, the clevis with the tongue and all that kind of thing. We, we did all axial forces. Um, and so we're going to introduce a new section now where not every force is going to be an axial force. Um, and we're going to do that with the topic of frames and machines, which um, we have to be careful to not think of frames and machines as trusses. A lot of times they might look like trusses. Um, they might even have some of the same features as trusses. Um, and in fact, sections of them may behave like trusses, but we have to keep them separate as far as um, how we're going to, in general, handle frames and machines versus how we handle trusses. Um, frames and machines are together because more or less they're, they're going to be handled the same way. Uh, the difference is going to be a frame is going to be something that's intended to be rigid. All the members stay put relative to one another. We're, like a, like a, we're going to use a bookshelf today as a frame um, in our example. A machine is going to be something like a pair of pliers or a jack or something where it has uh, the same kind of components maybe that a frame has, uh, but they are intended to move relative to one another. Now in this course, uh, this is all statics, so everything's in static equilibrium, so even the machines will be um, not moving exactly. So we're not going to be any kind of kinematics or dynamics or anything. Um, Let's start with making a couple of distinctions between uh, frames and machines and trusses. Um, and I'm just really going to talk about frames, uh, just so I don't have to say frames and machines over and over again. <clears throat> the big difference is that frames and machines um, are not trusses. And that's important because we had two methods method of joints and method of sections that we use to analyze trusses. Um, so since frames and machines are not trusses, that means we cannot use method of joints and method of sections. And this is one of the common problems that like a new person studying statics and mechanics um, they want to use method of joints and method of sections on a frame or a machine. Um, and all of those assumptions that we built into the trusses, uh, they don't all apply to every piece of a frame or machine. And so it's uh, tricky to use something like method of sections or method of joints. It doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, it just means you can't universally do that for a frame or a machine. And so in general, we're not going to, although there, there will be instances where it looks like a section, a portion of a frame behaves just like a truss. And that's going to be okay, but just think back when you're dealing with a frame or machine that in general, you can't just uh, universally apply method of sections or method of joints to that frame. Um, let's make some lists of things that trusses were that frames aren't necessarily going to be. So for trusses, um, one of the things that we said as our assumptions were that trusses had members connected by only two frictionless pins. So each member had two joints, one at either end of it. Um, they didn't have to be at the ends, but pretty much everything we did, they were at the ends. But the maybe more important part here was that there were only two of those. And we did call them frictionless. Connected by frictionless pins. And only two pins. So a frame, on the other hand, let's make it a different color. 
and machine so not just frame but a frame and machine um, you're gonna have the members uh, a lot of times we're gonna call the members beams not not all the time but many times um, there will be beams and I want to reword this to say they're connected by at least two pins so they can have more and again we might call these beams beams are going to be a special element where the members in the truss um, we could only stretch or compress um, but these beams will be able to flex so we'll be able to bend them and then I'm going to put at least two and again they're still going to be frictionless in our model <clears throat> so I've got a little thing I made here got some pins and so one pin here one pin here uh, from the side I can't really rotate it maybe I need to make one of these that stands on its edge anyway you know just little pins so this would work as a uh, truss member maybe if it was pinned here and here um, as long as we only applied forces here and here so you know we have our little force as long as we applied the forces at the uh, pins that was one of our rules um, but if I were to add another pin now it has three pins and but it's one continuous piece through here um, so this would violate my rule for a truss that that the, each member only had two pins now if, now if this was a piece and this was a piece and they happen to share this pin then that's okay still for a truss but you know with this being one solid piece and three pins locations then I have to treat this piece as a beam uh, and beams exist in frames not in trusses and so now I can't necessarily just use my method of joints and method of sections um, so that's one thing that could be different uh, from frame and machine versus a truss another thing so when we were dealing with trusses we said that uh, and I just mentioned it that there were no external forces on the members So external, they did have internal forces, like the force inside the member itself, but external forces. And a frame or machine Uh, it can have it doesn't have to have but it can have external forces applied directly on the member so I'll put can or may or whatever And this is where this member now becomes a beam. So in our little model up here, so we've got a truss member, it's got two pins. Um, forces are only applied here, but as soon as I put a force on the member itself, and let me turn it sideways so you can see. So when I, when I put forces here, at the pins you know the beam pretty much stays the way it is but if I can reach over as soon as I put a force somewhere in the middle see how it starts to flex or bend that is this member now is a beam and it's flexing it's not just stretching out or compressing it's actually flexing um, and so as soon as I do that add a force directly to a member somewhere then I have made it into a beam and it's not part of a truss 
and I can't use method of sections or joints, at least on that piece or any pieces connected directly to it. Um, another thing, and, and this is kind of a result, not a, another rule, but we said that when all the assumptions you know we also had like the member weight was negligible things like that all the assumptions were true that every member in a trust was a two-force member now technically you had some zero force members also but uh, that's not what I'm talking about Every member is a two-force member. For the frames and machines, that is not true. If every member in a frame or machine is a two-force member, then it's a truss. Um, so there's some members may be two-force members, is how we're going to word this for a frame or a machine. may be two force members it doesn't have to have any two force members but there could be some all right um now it's probably a good time to talk about two force members we've kind of already talked about them in the sense that they existed every piece of a truss was a two force member but um let's just go back over that and how we might find them if they exist in a frame or machine. So if you're in a frame or machine and you are trying to figure out if a piece is a two force member, here are a couple, just two um, rules to look for. Basically, you're looking for pieces that follow all of the truss rules. Um, and finding two force members in a frame or machine is sort of like finding uh, zero force members in a truss. It helps you out as far as uh, if you find a zero force member in a truss, you know, oh, I don't have to calculate that one, it's zero. Um, Similar kind of thing happens with two force members. They're not zero, but it does eliminate some variables that you have to deal with. So it's good to find two force members in a truss. Uh, well, they're all in a truss. It's good to find two force members in a frame or a machine because it helps you solve the problem a little bit faster. All right. So what you're looking for is a member with only two pins just like a truss so you know you're looking for a piece that just has the two pins it doesn't have a third pin or a fourth pin or any other number of pins it just has the two pins uh, that hold it together all right so that's one thing and then you want to find uh, the same member that has only two pins but with no external force applied on the member And they can be applied at the pins, you know, they can be applied at the pins, that's okay. They just can't be applied on the body of the member. So, <clears throat> you know, it's okay to put forces on the pins externally, that's okay. Um, but you can't put the force on the body. As soon as you do that, then that is a beam and, uh, and not a two force member. All right, so if that's true, if these two are true, then that piece is a um, two force member. And when you have two force members, the benefit is, so let's say here's our piece, it has forces, maybe there are, there are some forces 
connecting this together or whatever to other pieces at the pins. But when it's a two force member, it has two pins, no external forces, you know, I don't have don't have this going on, then there are two forces that have a line of action. You know, you complete the line between the two pins. That's the line of action. And the two forces have the same magnitude, but opposite directions. Or the same sense, though. They're both pointing away from the body, or they're both pointing towards the body. So tension, this would be tension, or compression. Um, if you don't have that, so let's have the exact same member. But let's do put a force on it somewhere. Let's put a force over here. So now it has the two pins, but it also has an external force applied to the body of the member. Now, instead of writing uh, just F along this line of action, I have to go in and write, well, let's, let's label them. This will be, uh, let's say that this is A, B. So this could be the force in member A, B. And this would be the force in member A, B. So this can be A and B. But here, what I have to do is, um, since I don't have a two force member, then this is AY and AX and BY, BX. So suddenly, here I had one unknown, just FAB. It was drawn twice, but um, it's the same magnitude. And I probably know this angle because I probably know the geometry that holds this member AB in place so I can figure out what angle it's at. Here, I have four unknowns. I guess I know this one maybe, maybe it's an external force I know the value of, but I don't know AX, AY, BX, or BY. So I have four unknowns versus one unknown. So if you're ever solving a frame or machine problem um, at this level, you know, the beginner level, then, uh, and you get to a point where there's too many unknowns and you can't write enough equations, there's a good chance that you have missed a two force member somewhere that's going to eliminate a lot of these unknowns. Or it doesn't eliminate it, it collapses them down into just a single force at an angle versus uh, all these unknowns. Um, so we want to find two force members in our trusses. <clears throat> um, how about we look at an example? So this is just going to be an introduction. It's not going to take terribly long to do. Um, we're going to do it really thoroughly, though, um, probably more than you would actually do if you were trying to solve uh, one of these problems because we're going to do more than you would need to solve it. Um, but just so we have a complete solution here. All right, so here's our little bookcase. Bookshelf, not bookcase. I'm going to put a curved piece in here just to have something to figure out how to deal with it. Uh, we're going to call this A, this point B, and this one C. Um, we're going to use our same kind of supports, the pin and the roller, maybe a chain or whatever. Um, the same kind of supports that we used for the trusses we'll use on these frames of machines. Um, actually, machines sometimes aren't bolted down like a pair of pliers. It's not going to have uh, a pin holding it to the table. You know, you're you're actually holding it. So sometimes machines don't have these external uh, support systems. I'm going to put a pin here, holding it onto the wall. You know, I don't think you would actually mount your bookshelf this way, but that's how we're going to do this one. This one, have a little roller. And uh, we got to put our books on there. So here are our stack of books. On our bookshelf, we laid them down flat for some reason. <clears throat> and we want to figure out what kind of forces exist in these members. Um, we'll put dimensions on it in a second. Um, I don't want to get it too cluttery right now because this isn't our free body diagram. It's connected to the wall here. 
So this is just kind of the sketch of what we have going on. Um, and we'll draw a, a true free body diagram in a second. Um, but at this stage, it's usually useful to go and find or look for two force members. Because if I can find any pieces that qualify as two force members, when I draw them or their free body diagrams, I only have to draw those two forces versus all these unknown forces. So I'm looking for members that have two pins. Um, all of these members have two pins, A, B, B, C, and A, C. They all have two pins, so they all fit that mold. Um, the other part is no external force applied to the member. Now, I do have an external force up here. I've got it spread out. You know, these books are kind of, you know, they take up some space and they're spread out over this top piece. So member A, B is not a two force member. But I don't have any forces applied to, you know, member B, C. There's no external forces applied to AC. There are forces like where the roller and the pin exist, um, but those aren't to the body of AC. They're to the joint there, and so that's okay, as long as it's not on the body. Um, so AC and BC, they are both two force members. So that will save me some amount of calculation um, when I go to draw free body diagrams of those pieces. So that guy's a two force member, and so is that one. Um, it's not imperative all the time that you find two force members, but a lot of times for these type of problems, you know, the more academic type of problem, um, it's going to be necessary to be able to solve it, the problem, um, to find the two force members. All right. The next step, most of the time, is the same as it is in trusses. So this is kind of the same, it's kind of parallel, where the trusses, you look for zero force members early on to see if you have any uh, things you don't have to solve for, they're already basically given. Um, same thing here, you look for two force members. Next step in a truss is normally find the external reactions. Same thing on this one is normally you're gonna find the external reactions. Um, again, a machine is, good chance you're not going to be looking for the external reactions because a pair of pliers may not have an external pin or roller or whatever. Um, frames usually do. Frames usually have a pin or a roller or both that you have to solve for. Um, so to do that, we need to draw a free body diagram. And it's really tempting to just draw in the two reactions at the pin and the one at the roller. Just draw them in on this. The problem with that is um, that later on you come back to this and now you wonder um was that an external force in addition to the force that was at the roller you know was this an external force here pulling up on this or is that the pin force and so it gets confusing so it is much better redraw your diagram as an actual free body diagram and um be clear that these are external reactions from the pin and from the roller, not in addition to the pin and roller. So let's draw it down here, um, the free body diagram of our bookshelf. I'll draw it a little bigger maybe so we can put some more dimensions on it. Okay, there's the basic thing. Um, now we need to replace all these things that we're applying force to it. We need to actually put the forces on here. Uh, so the pin has two forces, one in X and one in Y. Again, they don't have to be X and Y. They just need to be 90 degrees from one another. Um, and it usually makes sense to make them X and Y. So AX, AY, uh, you might wanna write R A X for the reaction at A so that you are certain what these are, but um, to me, A X and A Y are okay. C is a roller, um, it's rolling against this wall, so the reaction has to be perpendicular to the wall. Um, we don't know if it's this way or if it's this way, but uh, we pick one this way. 
and draw it. So these I just drew in the positive, you know, what normally is positive for X and Y direction. You could go in and figure out which way you wanted to draw them, but I just drew them in the positive directions. <clears throat> if one of them is backwards, when we solve our equations, we'll get a negative number. These books, we haven't really dealt with something like this. What we've done is we've basically come in and put a point load for our external forces. But this one might be better to show as a distributed load. So something like this, you know, it takes up this whole space and it's a bunch of arrows, no, no particular number of arrows. Um, this is just my symbol for an evenly distributed load. So evenly distributed, basically all these arrows, these little force vectors, they're all the same height. They're even. Um, throughout the rest of the course, we'll use these evenly distributed loads, and then we will use unevenly distributed loads. So An unevenly distributed load could be any shape, right? It could it could be any kind of polynomial or exponential or whatever. We're going to use one particular shape, and it's going to be this. So kind of like a arithmetic gradient type approach here, a triangle. So this one is more or less a rectangle. This one's more or less a triangle. Um, but you, you could have any shape you wanted. Um, these will do fine for what we need to do. <clears throat> so this one's an evenly distributed load. So the units on this thing, remember this is representing the stack of books. Um, and it, but it's spread out over some distance. So the way you quantify this would be uh, something like 10 pounds per inch. So for every inch of load that you have here, so um, 10 inches of load, then you have 10 pounds. So this total, and a lot of times you do this, you, you sum it all together, you lump it together into a point load so that you can actually put it into an equation so maybe you want a point load that represents this entire distributed load. Um, 10 pounds per inch spread over 10 inches. This point load would be 10 times 10, 100. I'm drawing it in a different color to remind myself that it's not an additional 100 pound point load. It's the, uh, and I'm going to call it the lumped load. maybe the concentrated load, uh, but it's where you had a distributed load and then you concentrated it down to a single point load to do some calculations with it. Um, so in the, in the example here with the evenly one, it's pretty obvious that, well, you just put that in the middle, right? For the unevenly one, you put it at the centroid of this shape. This shape is a triangle, so it's gonna be you know, somewhere over here. Two thirds of the base if this base is you know this distance down here so it's a uh, it's just like the tri the centroid that we did last time um, so this distance well we need some more distances don't we let's say that this distance is three inches so this distance from point a to here would be three plus half of ten it'd be eight inches and then um, put this one down here. This would be, let's just make this 14 inches. And then the one from AX to CX 
Let's make that, uh, I think I made it 12 inches the last time I did this. I think, let's see. I don't even know where I wrote it. Yes, I made it 12. All right. Um, and we have our two force members. You don't have to color your two force members. I'm just doing that to remind myself that they're two force members. All right. So this thing would be a free body diagram. It has three unknowns, AX, AY, and CX. It is not a concurrent force system because we don't have a single point where all of these forces intersect. We have, you know, there's an intersection point here and one here. Actually, I guess one all through here because this is distributed. So it's not a concurrent force system. Um, but that's a good thing because it means we have three equilibrium equations we can apply to this free body diagram. We can write X, Y, and our moment equation. And we have three unknowns, three equations that should work out for us okay to solve for all those unknowns. <clears throat> so that's generally the next step. Um, after we've got our free body diagram, generally the next thing is to apply your static equilibrium equations to solve for the external reactions. So let's do that. Um, let's see if we can get that on there, but we need a new sheet of paper, something like that, maybe. All right. Um, this does work a lot like how the truss would, um, where generally it's better to do the summation of moments about the pin. Remember, we had a pin at A up here. So generally that's going to be a good process is to do summation of moments about the pin. I'm going to do clockwise as positive. You can do counterclockwise as positive if you want to. Um, AY and AX, their line of this is this is my line of action, I guess. They both go through point A. So neither one of AX or AY create any kind of rotation. This thing does not want to rotate about point A if you push at in this direction or in that direction. Um, but this one does, and this is why I lumped it together, because if I don't lump this book distributed load, um, then I've got to figure out how am I going to add up all these forces. Um, so I'd have to do some kind of integration process to, to add them all up and multiply times their increasing distances. You know, so it's just easier to go in and lump their distributed loads into a point load temporarily just to do equations like this one um, and look at just that 100 pounds going about point A line of action is here the distance between A and that line of action is 8 inches so 100 pounds times 8 inches <clears throat> that is a clockwise I said clockwise is positive so I give that a positive term um, then I have CX with a horizontal line of action, so I need this distance, vertical, which I've got as 12 inches. I don't know the value for CX. It is trying to go around counterclockwise, though, so minus CX times 12 inches. Um, and these two uh, have to balance. If these two moments, 100 or 800 inch pounds times the CX times 12 inches, if those don't balance, then my free body I've drawn is rotating about point A one direction or the other. And I know it's not supposed to do that. Um, so if we solve this, we get CX is equal to um, 100 times 8 divided by 12, 66.7 pounds. And uh, it comes out as a positive number, which means we drew CX arrow in the correct orientation so it really is pointing that way um, now i need the ax and ay i'm probably just going to do forces in the y direction so i've got ay uh, minus the 100 pound lumped load or which is taking into account this entire distributed load so minus 100 pounds um, and that's the only thing in the y direction on the whole free body diagram is these two. So therefore, ay, 
Um, I move the 100, negative 100 to the other side, it becomes positive 100 pounds. And then summation of forces in the x direction, I have ax plus cx, um, and that's it. But I just found a value for cx earlier, 66.7 pounds. So ax plus 66.7 pounds that's going to give me AX as a negative. I move the 66 to the other side and it becomes negative. So AX is a negative 66.7 pounds. So that means I actually drew this arrow the wrong way. AX should be going to the left. Okay. <clears throat> now we've solved for all of our external reactions. Generally, this is where if we were working with a truss, we would decide are we doing method of joints or method of sections? Maybe we've already decided that, but we'd use one of those processes. Um, here, this is a frame. This one is a frame. These in pieces don't look like they have any way to move relative to one another. They basically have to stay in this shape and move as a one complete unit uh, versus something where one piece could swing in relation to another piece and become a machine. Um, so this is where uh, we take and not do method of joints or method of sections. What we do is we take each piece of our frame and analyze them individually. Um, you don't always have to analyze every piece. We're going to draw every piece for ours just because I want to show how they all fit together. But if you're actually working one of these, you probably just draw the first, the top piece here and you're done and that's it. Um, but we're going to draw each one of these pieces, uh, draw each one of their free body diagrams and show how they kind of fit together. So let's start with member A. Well, this was B. So AB. I'm going to put it uh, maybe over here. Okay. <clears throat> it has um, AY applied to it. Uh, 100 pounds. It has AX applied to it, which we found was actually negative, so I need to draw it the other way. And give it a positive sign. Or you can draw it the way it was and give it a negative sign, whichever way works better for you. Um, and then I decided or discovered that member AC was a two-force member. So when I draw any forces associated with that, I need to just draw them as two force member forces. So uh, the line of action, I connect the dots between A and C. It's a vertical line of action. I don't necessarily know which way to draw it. I just know to draw it vertical. Um, so let's just pick upwards. And um, so all I've done here is I have lined up this force with this line of action and I picked a direction for it. I need to do the same thing for what's going on at B, except that at B, you know, it was this curved one. So I really need to create a line of action between those two points. And draw on that line. Um, so let's pick a direction. Since we did this one up, let's do this one down. So this is where, if you didn't know these were two force members, instead of these two forces, you had to put BX and BY and another AX and AY over here for the member AC connection. Um, so this is the benefit of finding them as two force members. We also need the distributed load on here, so let's put it on. I do want to draw it as a distributed load, even though I'm going to put it as a lumped load in just a little bit. Um, I want to remember that it's actually a distributed load later on when I want to calculate this member AB and I want to see how much it's bending. I need to know that this was a distributed load versus a point load because they'll make the, the beam member AB bend differently if it's a point load versus something distributed. <clears throat> now, that I've done all that, let's actually go and put our lumped load in there. And I do normally like to draw them 
a different color uh, because to me that reminds me that they were from a lumped load, not a distributed load, or that this isn't the same thing. Um, let's put our, oh, I should have made some room. And then uh, we'll do this one down here. So we really could work on just this and find our two unknowns. We have two unknowns, but three equations to work with. So we could work with this, but we want to draw all of them. Um, we do know something more about this angle. This one was vertical, um, but we actually know about this angle too, right? Because I'm just using similar triangles here, 14, 12, and this hypotenuse we could calculate. All I'm doing is 14 squared plus 12 squared square root of that. Oh, 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 not that though. There, square root of that number. 19.44. <clears throat> so I can take that same measurement and put it on here if I want to. I want to use that later. <clears throat> All right, and so that's normally where I would stop and solve this one, but we're going to keep going and draw the free body diagrams for the other pieces here because there are some important things to keep in mind. So remember AC, just the, the vertical piece right here. So this was one of my two force members. So whatever I do with it, I really only want to have two forces on it. If I ever put a third force or more on it, then it's not a two force member and I can't just do the what I did here with FAC. Um, that's also why I put these 166.7 pounds. These were from the pin that was originally holding this whole thing to the wall. Um, they don't actually get applied to both member AB and member AC. You have to apply them to one of those. Um, and since member AC was a two force member, I didn't want to put them on there. So I put them on member AB. All right. <clears throat> I've also already determined it, the direction for these arrows. I did that when I drew this arrow because this is the member or the force in member FAC, I draw it. Here it's probably best to think of this as either pointing towards the body or away from the body, not up and down and left and right. Um, so when I drew FAC, I drew it as a force that points towards the body. So every time I draw FAC on here, it needs to point towards the body. So towards the body that it's associated with, this one's associated with that body. This one's associated with this body. This one also should associated with this body. It needs to point towards it. And so I'm establishing my equal magnitude but opposite direction reactions uh, by doing it this way. Same thing when I go to do BC. Let's put it over here, I guess. Now, BC, it's the one that had the uh, line of action, you know, going out this way, not necessarily along the member since the member was crooked. It still is a two force member, though. <clears throat> and I've already established uh, the sense for FBC. I said it points away from the body. So I pointed it away from this body AB. So that means I need to make it point away from these. So pointing away from this body, pointing away from it down here. And I've got my equal magnitudes, but all the opposite reaction directions so that I have uh, this thing balanced. Um, I'm missing one thing though. I have not put member C or force CX. That CX was from the roller. 
I haven't put that on anything yet. If I put it on AC, AC is not a two force member because it has a third force. If I put it on BC, BC is not a two force member because it has a third force. And if I do that, then I lose the ability to have just FBC here. I have to have BX and BY, BX and BY here, and CX and CY here. So I, I don't want to do that. So I have one other option, and that is to take just C. So there's like an actual pin in here and take just that pin and create a free body diagram for it. Put CX on that thing. CX was 66.7 pounds. Uh, C is also connected to both of these. You can see it there and there. Um, so I need to put these two forces that are at these C's. So FAC points towards the body. Well, but I don't want it, but it's coming from the other direction. I should have drawn that this way, pointing towards it this way. Um, here, FAC points away from the body this way. Uh, FBC, I think it's, I said AC, FBC. Um, I wish I had some white out. I don't think I have. Actually, I might if it'll write. I don't know if it'll write or not. Let's see. Nope, it's going to not right we can kind of make it pink um, so anyway that's not there uh, so here it could point towards the body either way obviously because it's just a dot but what I need to do here is recognize that I'm talking about the uh, pin at C so if I have this force pointing upwards at the pin then the correlating free body diagram where I've taken the pin out of here has to show the equal magnitude but opposite direction so it has to point downwards um, so you do have to get these in the correct orientation I almost uh, did it wrong there because I did point it towards the body but the body is just a dot so when the body is a dot and not a member then you do have to go in and make sure that you're keeping your sense correct so opposite direction here otherwise it won't come out in equilibrium um, okay so I don't like that being on oh now I can't even do that well anyway um, now I can take any one well I couldn't take these right these two um, they're correct but they don't have any known values it's all just says that BC equals BC and AC equals AC, so it doesn't actually help me a whole lot. So I can take either this one or this one and apply my equilibrium equations. Down here, uh, this is a concurrent force system, so I could just use uh, X and Y equations and solve for AC and BC there, um, and that would probably be the simplest thing to do, but we're actually going to work on this one just to have another practice with the distributed load. So let's take this free body diagram, draw it again, and uh, solve that. And I think that will finish out our introduction to frames and machines. Uh, and then we'll, we'll gradually add more stuff to it next time. But uh, this will get us the idea of what to do. So there's our force. Oh, man, my paper's all crooked. We just draw it crooked. All right. Um, we had AC, we don't know, but we drew it this way. Uh, BC, we don't know, but we drew it this way. And um, 100 pounds, this was the pin reaction. We called it AY. We do know it. We solve for it when we solve for the entire uh, assembly uh, and found the external reactions. Um, AX we found was supposed to go this way and it was 66.7 pounds. We had our distributed load which was 10 pounds per inch 
and we lumped it into a point load just to work with it that was 100 pounds. It was eight inches over. And then we also had three inches here, 10 inches here, and even though it doesn't look to scale, we had one inch over here. And this whole thing is a non-concurrent force system. Um, it has two unknowns, AC and BC, and um, we have three equations to work with. The moment equation, the forces in Y, and forces in X. Um, X and Y, uh, if we did X, that would work to solve for FBC because the AC component only has a Y component, or the AC force only has a Y component. Um, so we could solve for the X force there. Um, but I think I'm going to stick with what I normally do and write the moment about this pin. So this will be A. And I'm going to do summation of moments about A for just this free body diagram. Every time you write a new free body diagram, you get a new set of equations. All right. Um, the line of action for the 100 and the AC don't create moments about A. The 66.7 does not create a moment about A. The 100 does. 100 pounds, it has an eight inch moment arm. Whoops, I don't know what I'm writing some extra stuff there. Um, eight inch moment arm from this line of action over to point A is eight inches. Um, clockwise, this guy's at an angle, so we could figure out there's the line of action and we could figure out you know what's the perpendicular distance between a and there we could do that if we wanted to but um, what I normally do is use the X and Y components now the X component line of action goes through point A so we don't need to worry with it in this equation um, so we only need the Y component which is F BC times, and we need this that angle again, which we've got to go get. Here it is. We set that as a 12, 14, 18.44 triangle. Um, let's put that on here. So 14, 12, and 18.44. So if we only want the Y component, uh, and it's going to go around you know, if I'm pushing this way, it's going to go around clockwise. So plus um, F, B, C, the Y component is 12 over 18.44. Um, this is just the Y component. I need to multiply times its moment arm. This is the line of action. The moment arm is this entire length, which I don't have on here, but it's uh, 10 plus 3 plus 1, 14. Uh, and so I can solve this. Uh, but it does turn out that FBC is going to be negative. Um, and let's see what number it is. 100 times 8. So there's 800 inch pounds divided by 14 divided by 12 over 18. 87.8. And that negative sign there means that everywhere, let's see if I can find our picture again. Where did I put it? Oh, it's right here. Everywhere, or right, cover that up. Everywhere I drew an, which one did I just saw for BC? Everywhere I drew a BC, it's the wrong way. Um, so you do have to deal with that. So everywhere that you have drawn FBC, then it is incorrect. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm missing AC. It looks like I should write equations in the y direction. And I have 100 FAC minus this 100. Uh, I guess I never drew it on here, but I assume that you recognize I'm using X is positive this way. Y is positive when it goes up. 
so minus 100, and I only need the y component again, so minus f b c times that y component 12 over 18.44 if you like using the angle you know actually calculating angle theta in there and, and doing actual sines and cosines and that's completely fine um, just a lot of times this way is faster because um, you don't have to calculate the angle and then use the angle to calculate this number um, so this 100 cancels out there f b c we actually just found a value for it. This is why I write the equations based on the free body diagram is because I don't want to get confused on the negative sign. Um, so now I would rewrite this 0 equals FAC maybe I would move the negative FAC over here or whatever minus and then FBC is a minus or negative times 12 over 18.44. So this ends up being a positive term, but then I move it to the other side of the equal sign to solve for AC and it becomes negative again. So I just, you have to be very careful with all of these things. So 87.89 times 12 divided by 18.44, uh, I did plus. <laughs> 87.8 times 12 divided by 18.44. 57.14 but it's negative 57.14 so everywhere that I drew wait on yeah here everywhere I drew AC I drew it the wrong direction so you, you do have to uh, make sure that you are keeping up with the negative signs because it can be that every one of them got drawn backwards from what you needed like we did with AC and BC. It's not a problem. It just means that uh, you have these negative signs that will tell you that these signs, these arrows are drawn the wrong way. So you do have to get these chained together correctly. So just think about when you put A back together, these ACs are internal. So they need to disappear when you put it back together. So you put this piece back onto this piece and the FACs will cancel in the Y direction. So they, they disappear. So you put these, well, I don't have that, that those aren't good. Put this back to here and the BCs here will cancel each other out. And so you do need to make sure that they cancel each other out. Um, same thing here. These cancel each other out in the Y direction. Here, BC, FBC cancels each other out in that direction. If, if you ever have a free body diagram where the forces don't cancel each other out, it's not in static equilibrium and it's moving. And so that's okay. It just is not okay when we're doing things that are in static equilibrium. And we certainly don't want um, these to not cancel each other out because these, this is the force that's holding member AC to member AB. And if it is not in balance, that means they are not connected together. They're exploding apart. So try to keep those things in mind when you're drawing these free body diagrams of individual parts that connect to one another. Um, okay, I think that's enough for an introduction for frames and machines. And um, we'll do some more frames and machines. It's a you know one of the bigger topics in the course. And so we'll do quite a bit more on it, uh, some more examples. Um, also introduce the distributed loads. We'll, maybe next time we'll use one of the unevenly distributed loads to see how they work. Um, but uh, I think for today we've got enough uh, new content to look at for a while. And we'll see you again actually on Thursday. Wednesday we've got an exam, so we'll be back on Thursday.